So like many of you, I'm sure, I wear a lot of hats. Not literally, but figuratively. I'm a psychologist, but I also manage a uh, good-sized psychology department at um, Nebraska Medicine, which is a large teaching hospital in Omaha. I'm a consultant in, on human factors for the United States Air Force. I provide telemental health uh, services to people in Alabama, Nebraska, and Virginia. Uh, but I'm also in school, going back to school, because uh, academics never quit. And I'm pursuing a postdoctoral MS in clinical psychopharmacology. So I'm very busy. But, but much more important than all that, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a so-so racquetball player, and I'm a big advocate for and proponent for flotation therapy. So my presentation today is to tell you guys the story of how I came to become an advocate for flotation. So this story starts about three years ago um, when my wife and I, still in the Air Force, got orders to Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. I'm from the South, I'm from Texas. I do not do cold weather very well at all. So this was kind of upsetting, but we uh, geared ourselves up and we prepared for this move. And then about a month before we were supposed to go, uh, the Air Force pumped the brakes on it. And they said, no, we actually, we found a better use for your, your talents. We want to send you to this large military intelligence organization because they have the highest level of stress ever recorded in the history of the Air Force. You see, a year prior to this, in 2015, a number of psychologists had actually gone into one of these units and asked them questions about their stress level, their sleep, their anxiety and, and PTSD symptoms, their relationships, their alcohol use, all these different met metrics. And it was far and above what was not just the norm for the Air Force, but for some of the other high-stress career fields in the Air Force. And the, the commander at the time, the person in charge of all these people said, we need a psychologist to come in and fix it. Literally, my first meeting with him, this is what he said. He laid all this out for me and said, I don't care what you do, how you do it, what money you need, what resources, just come to me and let me know. All I want is for this to go away. Fix it. So this is that story. And I tell this story to you so that you can may pass it on and, and it can become a, a part of our collective story of what flotation therapy can do for people. Now, before I go any further, um, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't have a, a, a book to hawk or a program or anything like that. I'm doing this purely out of, my, out of the goodness of my heart. I'm not standing up here trying to represent the United States Air Force, the DOD, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary of Defense, or Donald Trump. So these are my own statements. Please don't take them as an endorsement from uh, anybody higher than, than me, okay? Um, and I am a, a psychologist. I love to be called Dr. Walker, but I do recognize I'm not that kind of doctor. So who are we talking about here? The highest stressed people in the United States Air Force. Well, these are intelligence personnel, people who uh, conduct real-time intel on the ground and in aircraft with special operations personnel. Now, what's interesting is everybody else in that aircraft is specially trained to perform special operations missions. That's why they're super special, except our guys. Our guys don't get that kind of vetting. And so they come into the intelligence career field thinking they might be one of the eggheads who gets to sit behind a screen and watch things that are happening thousands and thousands of mile, miles away, and they're safe. But not these guys. They're in the aircraft with a special operations crew, and they're getting shot at. They're protecting people who are getting shot at. They're trying to keep everybody safe, including themselves and the other people in that aircraft. High, high stress position. And because they're good at their job, the demand keeps increasing. So now they are in almost every single special operations aircraft that we have in the Middle East and all over the world, which means because there's only so many of them, they're frequently deploying. Um, at one point, less than a one-to-one -one deployed dwell time, which means they go out for three months, they come back, maybe only be back around at uh, home side with their families for about two months or so, and then they go back out again. You can imagine how stressful and difficult that is to maintain a, a good social life family life, to have stability in your sleep cycles. And so as a result, a lot of these folks developed some pretty maladaptive coping strategy, strategies, as one might expect. So when the psychologists came in and they, they asked all these questions, um, they put together a sort of causal model of what was going on. You can see from the top, there's a lot of different factors playing into the overall stress level. 
And these are a bunch of, you know, uh, fancy words on here. There's things like cynicism and role overload, emotional exhaustion, occupational burnout, which we kind of get and which c- can be a part of a bunch of different jobs. But what I, I, the reason I put them up here is because they were, I mean, high, again, high in, in a way much uh, greater in, in terms of frequency and severity for this population. So myself and my, and my teammates, we looked at this and we said, okay, out of all these different factors, all the things contributing to these negative outcomes, what in the world can we actually control? What can we affect to change the outcome? And it was this increased physiological response to stress. Now, if you guys aren't familiar, we've got this cool little thing in, the, in, in our bodies called the autonomic nervous system, the ANS. And it's divided into two separate uh, components, the sympathetic nervous system, which you may have heard referred to as our fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the off switch to the fight or flight response. And the reason I show this slide is because it, it gives you an idea of which nerves are innervating which organs, where they uh, are along the vertebral cro- column, and you can see that's not exactly one to one. It's not a direct on switch and a direct off switch. It's this on switch is going to stimulate a lot of different actions, going to raise uh, your heart rate, blood pressure. It's going to uh, oxygenate your muscles, prepare you for action, uh, make you start to sweat, tremble, dilate your pupils, get you ready to fight off or run away from whatever threat you have available or that's in the, the pr- uh, proximal vicinity. But the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't quit all that. It helps to relax us, but it's not, it doesn't do everything. I'll, say, I'll show you why this is important. Our bodies are designed to try to maintain homeostasis. So... We want to get to an optimal level of physiological arousal in any uh, given situation. And this varies depending on context. So sometimes, like, you know, when you're sitting here and you're listening to a speaker, you don't need a bunch of energy. You can be relaxed. That may be, uh, you know, calm, kind of steady state. And that's where we are most of the day. But if you're in a high-performance type situation, like say, you know, you're getting ready to play a football game or you're giving up to give a presentation to a bunch of people in the audience. Maybe you want to be in, in more of a ready, active, uh, operational state. A little bit of heightened physiological arousal, but not something that's going to dramatically impair your performance. Hence the right-hand side of that yerkes dodson curve I show in the lower left, uh, left-hand corner of this slide. Where it gets to be a problem is when this gets chronic. When you're up and you're elevated at this level for an extended period of time, now, not only does it wear on you mentally and emotionally, but your body, uh, your organ systems start to become less effective at what they're doing. They start to break down, and they start to deteriorate. And now you're having physical ailments in addition to uh, mental and emotional ailments. So recognizing all that, my team and I uh, settled on flotation therapy, essentially restricted environmental uh, stimulus therapy treatment for our folks. And uh, you kind of have to get creative when you sell something like this to your higher-ups, people who are not as psychologically minded. So this is how I framed it. I know most of y'all are ignoring me and reading that right now. But you know, basically, if you sound smart, you can sell anything to anybody. If I went up to him and, and to the wing commander and I said, uh, you guys are, your guys are stressed out, I want to throw them throw in this uh, float pod and deprive them of all sensory input. And it won't be a torture device. They'll totally love it. Um, that would not have gone over well. So this is how we went about convincing the, the higher-ups to throw some money at, at float tanks and to, to give us a shot. And part of that was, prove to me that this works. What, get some data that actually shows that we didn't just give you, you know, X amount of dollars and you threw it away on, on something, you know, fancy but not ultimately effective. Well, fortunately, I had a lot of research to back this up. And in fact, um, these are some, some great research studies that were done actually a while ago. We've known about the benefits of float tanks for, for a long time uh, to demonstrate how impactful this is, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. And we're talking about reductions in uh, adrenocorticotropin releasing hormone, which is the, the big hormone that's released from our brain to trigger the stress response. Reductions in that, reductions in cortisol, which is corollary, lowered heart rate and blood pressure, as we would expect, in as little as three to seven sessions. That's, un- that's outrageous. If a lot of people take medications for this, but they take them long term, and sometimes they don't have that kind of effect until they've been, they've been taken for several weeks at a time. But if you're telling me in three to seven one-hour sessions, you can get the same kind of impact, I mean, that's a no-brainer, especially cost-wise. 
And so when you're looking at the myriad of different things that our guys were experiencing, remember I said stress, um, sleep problems, chronic pain, there's a hierarchical, hierarchical order to that. Because of stress, they're experiencing this. Because of this, they're experiencing that. Second and third order effects. And look like float tanks can help with all of those different things because it specifically targets those first order items. Stress, anxiety, burnout-related depression. These are things that we needed help with. And we, know, we knew that we couldn't do it alone. Imagine trying to have one-on-one -on -one coaching therapy mentorship sessions with 300 different people. You can't effectively do that. You've got to give them something else. And this is something they could do in their own time. So for this study, we, uh, we, we got a contract with a local LLC that provided flo uh, flotation therapy. And we told our guys about it. In fact, we, we uh, told them other studies, uh, other folks, uh, high-stress folks, where this has, had worked and tried to get them to buy into it. Um, now, because we, we, we need a high sample, we need a lot of folks to actually do this, we opened it up to their spouses as two who were also pretty stressed out from dealing with their, their spouses and all, everything they went through. But they didn't uh, comprise a strong component of the sample, so I think, think it's still representative of these high-stress folks overall. All right. Um, now, I'm a big stats guy. I include some of the stats on these uh, latter slides. Um, if you're interested, you can come talk to me about it afterwards. But uh, if, if not, you can just you know, take my word for it. Okay. We had 91 folks do a self-selected protocol of float therapy. And I'll show you the, the breakdown number of sessions, but basically we didn't say, you've got to do this, you've got to do it on this time. We just said, hey, try this out. If you like it, keep going. And we didn't exclude anybody either. In a traditional randomized controlled clinical trial, usually you have a, a weightless control group that you can use for comparison. Decided not to do that because I didn't want to um, prohibit anybody from getting this, this kind of treatment. These guys needed help right away, so I figured that was much more important than having a, a well-designed traditional uh, clinical research trial. And we can still make pre-post um, uh, outcome derivations because of this. This is all the demo demographic data um, that I am able to present because uh, the, you know, this is a, a, a intelligence military intelligence unit. But trust me when I say this was very representative of their entire unit. So uh, we get general generalizability here. For those of you who are interested, we did um, ask for mostly self-report uh, self indices, so have people uh, rank their sleep quantity, or sorry, to, to respond to their sleep quantity, rank their sleep quality, pain, stress, uh, but before and after the sessions. But then we also had a standardized uh, clinical outcome measure called the OQ45. Now that has uh, five, or sorry, four different scales that align with some of the indices that we wanted to look at for outcome measures, but I also did a, a few nifty statistical analyses of my own to see which of these items tended to uh, correlate together. You have somebody answered this item one way, what other items they also answer in a similar manner. And that allowed us to derive uh, a few additional scales specific to depression, anxiety, and burnout, which were also of clinical interest for the study. And interestingly, all the items in those scales map on almost one-to-one -one with DSM-5 uh, symptoms for each of those uh, respective diagnostic uh, codes. So I feel like those are really good uh, indications for people who are feeling depressed, anxious, um, clinically burnout, and so on and so forth. Now, of those 91 folks who actually uh, had or attended one flotation session, only a handful of them went on, you know, further and further until we got to about sessions seven, eight, and nine. Um, which is where I conducted uh, a number of, or most of the analyses that you're going to see. Not just because I wanted to make sure that it was you know, the effect of the float tanks, but because these people who actually continued with floating tended to be a lot higher acuity, meaning their, uh, their baseline scores in the OQ45, their level of sleep, the pain and stress they were reporting were much higher than people who maybe only did two or three sessions, which makes sense. You know, about half of the, the folks involved in the study quit after the third session because they probably got what they needed and they were good to go or perceived themselves as good to go. And as the people who uh, had a lot more impairment, who were struggling more, those are the ones who were benefiting but decided to keep coming to try to get even more benefit. All right, so here's the big takeaway. What did we find? Well, because I'm here, obviously it was something good, right? 
So we'll start with stress. After the first session, one session of flotation, stress range de decreased by 60%. You can't get that with traditional therapy. I promise you. I'm a psychologist. I can tell you this. <laughs> That's unheard of. And it sustained itself. That's even cooler. We get out to seven, nine sessions, and people are saying, my stress is gone. It's something that not just when they leave the float tank session, but they come back for their next one, and they said the past two weeks, I've been feeling great. And that's why, too, I included these quotes from people because I think the objective data is important. We want to see the, the numbers. And in fact, that's what, that's what my bosses wanted to see. They said, show me objectively that people are improving. But the stories, the individual stories are also important. And you'll see that on a number of these slides as well. Pain. Chronic pain is huge. There's a lot of non-pharmacological treatments for, for chronic pain out there. And in fact, um, you know, where I work now at Nebraska Medicine, we have a whole program devoted just to non-opiate uh, treatment of pain, of chronic pain. And you're telling me, if I get in this float tank, and I just float for an hour, you can cut my pain down by almost two-thirds? Unheard of. Unbelievable. And I can tell you personally, I carry a lot of stress, and as a result, have some pain in my uh, upper shoulders and my neck in my, fl my first float session because um, I had to try it out if I was going to make other people do it, um, was a little bit painful. And I, I started to feel kind of where I was holding that stress and what it, what it was and what it felt like. And it allowed me to not only be better connected with my muscles, but to actually release and let it go. Second session was phenomenal. I didn't have pain for, for like weeks after that. Now, I did some additional analyses with stress and pain because these were two of the biggest findings that, that we had. I mean, the most dramatic effects were for stress and pain. So I, I wanted to look at and see, um, does how frequently you go make a difference? Or th the latency and time between sessions? Well, as you would probably expect, um, <laughs> th trust me, this took a lot of time and a lot of statistical analysis to tell you what's very common sense. The more frequently you go, the more and better effect you get from flo floating. Unbelievable, I know, unbelievable. I spent probably a full day trying to, to work on the data and code it just to be able to tell you something that's pretty, pretty common sense. But that's not all. Interestingly, um, the fewer sessions that you have between floating help to sustain that, that stress response. So it wasn't just um, that you felt better after the, the float, but you, you, you stayed better longer the more frequently that you, you floated. Um, also, remember I was talking about those second order effects? You know, I'm stressed out, so I'm drinking heavier. And because I'm drinking heavier, I'm having problems at home, and I'm not sleeping well, those kinds of things. We already knew that a lot of, our, a lot of these guys were self-medicating with alcohol because they were so stressed out. They had a lot of pain. They couldn't sleep. Very cool that the more frequently they floated, the less they used alcohol the less they had the need to self-medicate. And this is crucial because I think this applies to a lot of other things as well. We're talking about a reduced physiological arousal that completely gets rid of the need to self-medicate with other things. Could we also be talking about opiates for pain medication? Could we be talking about some psychotropics? It's entirely possible. Something to consider. This was really cool. When it came to sleep, Folks told us that the more floating that they did, the more they slept. Imagine getting three and a half hours extra of sleep every week. That's a super long nap, or like two naps. But imagine how much better you would start to feel over you know, the course of, of several weeks and several months. And not only that, but their sleep quality started to improve. This goes back to activation of the parasympathetic nervous system that happens in float tanks. General mental health indices showed some improvement. But again, these are secondary and, and um, third uh, tertiary effects from some of these other things like pain and stress. As pain and stress goes down, uh, our overall mental health, how we feel, our levels of happiness, our uh, interest and pleasure and things that we used to enjoy starts to go up. And this was big. This was huge. So for depression and anxiety, our folks are getting better. I mean, just... Without a doubt, um, so much quicker 
than they have been in the things that they were trying previously. A lot of guys, th these guys were pretty fit. So a lot of them used exercise, which is great. Perfectly natural, uh, quote unquote, remedy for anxiety and depression. But it wasn't doing it for them. And so by using floating, they were able to reduce not just their depression and anxiety, but also a lot of the symptomatology of PTSD. Um, and that's something that actually I'm, I'm in the process of investigating now is for people who experience this, this combat and trauma-related exposure and who have some of these symptoms of not just anxiety but PTSD, how does that impact them? Uh, one thing I heard over and over again was um, this reduced the frequency and intensity of flashbacks and nightmares, which gives people huge relief. And I think a big part of that is they don't have the, the, the stimulation, the constant stimulation to continually feed up their physiological arousal. They just get just a one-hour break of this once or twice a week. Um, it's huge for helping them reset their overall baseline arousal, and so they don't get up to that threshold where they do start to panic and they do start to have those symptoms. Another secondary effect, it, relationships improve. Look at that. I'm stressed out. I'm not as angry. I'm more calm at home. Now all of a sudden I'm not fighting with my spouse as much. Kids aren't aggravating me. I actually, I'm engaged. I'm not just sitting there fist balled up trying to manage this anxiety and depression I'm experiencing. I can actually get back involved with my, with my family members. Giving people their, their lives back is huge. One interesting thing. <laughs> we can't make people love their job uh, more but we can make it more bearable for them, <laughs> uh, which is kind of what you'd expect. Um, and this was, this was one of my discrimin discriminatory validity factors. A lot of times when you give people um, in scientific trials, when you give them a treatment or a medication, they have this halo effect where everything improves and uh, everything is sunshine and daisies and they just feel great, um, even if you wouldn't necessarily think that you know, this medication sh should affect other things. So... Um, for them to say, yeah, job still sucks, <laughs> I was like, okay, good. You're actually responding truthfully to, to some of these other indices. <laughs> and physical health, I wish I could have done more for this. And in fact, in subsequent uh, research studies that I've done, I'm actually doing one on uh, meditation right now using a smartphone app. We, we dug into this a lot more because I think there's more to unpack when it comes to overall physical health. But for the purpose of, of this study and trying not to give people survey fatigue by asking them questions over and over and over, um, I just gave them one global question referent to their general physical health. How are they, how healthy do they feel and, and how bad is their um, you know, most significant uh, physical problem? So that seemed to improve somewhat. Um, I would have really loved to have done uh, swabs, like salivary swabs, to look at cortisol levels, cortisol being one of the major uh, neuroendocrinological factors in stress, but that was cost prohibitive. Um, it's kind of expensive, you know, especially at 20, 30 bucks a pop to try to do that for, for so many people, and so um, that would have been really cool, something I'm hoping to do in the future. So you're telling me these people can focus better at work? They're going to be prone to fewer errors? They're not going to make as many mistakes? Yeah, I'm, I'm sold on that. So here's the overview. There's a lot of positive benefits from flotation therapy. And again, we know this, but now you can see with some, some people who are called into high-stress situations who are doing, you know, great, amazing, uh, miraculous things sometimes, performing at the highest gain, both intellectually and physically, how they can still have problems and they can still benefit from this. I think flotation is not just for the layman. I think it's even more critical for people who are called into high performance situations. Pro athletes, um, people who, I mean, neurosurgeons, goodness. Um, people in those high stress career fields can definitely benefit um, from this. And I think there's a huge market to, to helping people recognize all the different benefits that um, this has over time. And that's tongue in cheek with... Oh, did I, did I take it out? Oh, man, I, th I think I'm so funny. I used to have a piece at the bottom of my summary that said world peace, um, and I guess I took it out because I didn't think it was appropriate for this venue, so. <laughs> well. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, the uh, too long did not read version um, is that, and here's what, what we think actually happened, that we were able to reduce that sympathetic nervous system arousal 
while concurrently activating parasympathetic nervous system ar uh, arousal and, and, and activation using the float tanks. And all it was was just giving people a break, giving them a mental and physical break. And as a result of that, their stress and anxiety went down. Their pain improved. They saw their relationships improve. They're sleeping better. They can handle their jobs more. And they have better mental clarity. All these things follow one from the other just because we we're able to tackle some of the biggest things on their plate. When I said I, I looked at the latency between sessions, it, interesting, we actually had a number of people um, deploy <laughs> right when we started this study, and they're constantly going in and out. So this was pretty widely variable um, throughout the, the study. But regardless of that, just seven and nine flotation sessions, it doesn't matter when they were, over the course of this one year where we collected data, we cut st stress and pain in half. Improved sleep, improved relationships, and we're able to offer, you know, perhaps a good adjunct to therapy, something that maybe on its own doesn't do it for everybody and, and probably shouldn't. If you've got mental health issues, there's obviously a lot more going on, but we can mitigate some of the physiological um, vulnerabilities associated with that and help people focus more fully on what it is they need to address. Imagine, I'm just thinking about this from a psychological standpoint, imagine if you had a, a client who's heavy-handed and dealing with all these different things and they're able to get some sense of relief. They get increased mental clarity. Their stress goes down. How much better are they gonna do through, through traditional talk therapy or, th or be able to meditate on their own? So here's all the reasons why you, know, you can't take this to the bank. <laughs> So it's important for scientists to recognize that we do have limitations. Not every research program is perfect. I, I got some of this out before. We had um, you know, people who were deploying in and out, so that's why I looked at time between sessions. Um, we did have some spouses involved in the data collection, but again, they were also pretty high stress too. Um, looking into a, a deep tissue massage and flotation combo, maybe one, doing one before the other. A uh, few, few of our folks did do that, so it wasn't just flotation and, and isolation. Um, but again, this, I think the generalizability of the study is for anybody who's working through a high-stress situation, either professionally or personally, I think they would reasonably stand to benefit, and as dramatically as I've described. So just so you think I didn't pull all this stuff out of my you know, rear end. Uh, <laughs> I know it's, uh, it's tight and kind of crammed in there, but I've got a couple pages of references. Um, as an aside, the personal stories that I got from this, more so than all the objective data, made all of it worth it. Um, I had actually interviewed a guy for uh, one of my podcasts, a master sergeant who'd been in for like 16 years, high-performing guy, he told me he would not be alive without flotation. He was very seriously considering suicide, and it was through successive floating uh, services or appointments that he finally was able to get some of the relief that he needed. And uh, he fully credits his survival today with flotation. And in fact, um, in the interim time after he, he moved to a new duty station and didn't even have that available to him, he's been going on his own every few weeks because he knows he's important to him. So I just want to share that with you guys. If you have any questions, I'm going to be just, uh, I think, down the road here um, out the side door, and I'd be happy to, to speak with you one-on-one -on -one if you want to know more about me or about my study. I thank you for your time. Uh, uh.